you doing? Great. How many of you here are anxious to know the one demo day? Quite a few of you. All right, cool. We'll, we'll keep it short then. So that the format of, of this panel, we're going to talk about growth hacking. So we've got some actually, some, some guys, a lot of experience in this area. So we're going to talk for about 30 minutes about the topic. We hope it's interesting. We hope it's valuable. After that 30 minutes, we're going to open it up to you guys. So you, any questions you have on the subject, you can, you can ask this awesome panel. Afterwards, so at 6, we'll take a five minute break, and then we're going to announce straight away the winners of Demo Day. So be patient and bear with us. So I'll introduce the, the judges briefly for those who haven't been here in any other events. We've got Santiago, partner of 500 Startups. We've got Marcelo. Uh, oh, round of applause for Santiago. <laughs> so, we've got Marcelo, who's a, a partner at 21212 Accelerator in Brazil. Uh, Marcelo. And we have El Russo, as he likes to be called in Chile. Gleb from Russia, who is also a partner at uh, a fund there, and who's now looking actively at investing in Latin America. So Gleb, thanks for being here. Okay, so I'm gonna take a seat. So we chose, can you all see me? Not really, it's okay. So we're gonna talk about growth hacking today. Uh, raise your hand if at some point you've thought about doing growth hacking or it's something you wanna get, get engaged in. Okay, a lot of you. At least when I read about growth hacking, there seems to be a lot of mysticism around what this actually is. There's a lot of uh, people think that this is a magic solution if you apply to your company and you immediately just grow and have success. So can you guys tell us what really is growth hacking, growth hacking and what is it not, right? I feel like there's a lot of entrepreneurs who misunderstand what this is. So I'm gonna throw that question out to you guys. Sure, so for me, like a lot of people ask this question and then they answer, oh, it's just a na new name for marketing. And the problem with that is that you think that it's an external thing or at least external to your product or your sales or your customer experience, and it's just getting people to know about your startup. And really, I think it's a little bit more of integrating all of that in, in everything else you're doing. So you have to integrate how you're selling your product and getting people to know about your product in the customer design, in, in the user experience design, and in everything in the product design area, so you can really get more customers. So for me, it's just bringing that mar external marketing idea and bringing it to everything else you're doing. I think um, first, depend on kind of business you have, right? Um, I always say that you need to have a great product, but you need to have a great strategy of distribution of your product. And if, if you have a B2C product, definitely you need to do, dominate growth hacking and, and use uh, all kinds of possibilities to attract uh, your customer to, 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 to your product. But um, I also like to defend and, 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 and make people think that there is, exists a lot of other ways to attract a massive amount of clients, like partnerships, right? So I always try to think, okay, who has a lot of users base that can put my product and offer to them? So I don't have to be concerned about uh, the whole strategy of marketing. And uh, my whole career, I use a partnership with carriers Right, so uh, value-added services, and it was great. And uh, I do this with banks, so I know banks has a lot of millions and millions of customers. Uh, I do this with uh, other media groups. So I'm, I'm thinking like, okay, you have two chances. Either you should do both, maybe. You should go for those partnerships and also do your own growth hacking, because once the guy uh, see a product by the carrier here, Definitely, we'll Google it, and he can, if he can find it, he's not going to think it's a good product. So it depends on the type of business you have, in my opinion. Well, my thing will be here probably like this. When I talk to many startups and ask my favorite question, how you will get traction? You probably love this question too, right? So I sometimes hear back, oh, we will draw that. And this sounds like... We, we solve everything already, we will grow hack. And the thing is that, um, despite how I love the buzzwords, uh, growth hacking is a 
huge hell of a job. It's a lot of really manual work and nasty work. It's really like uh, um, putting your uh, hands in, a, in, a, in the dirt and uh, doing everything that you probably uh, not supposed to do before you started this business. That's what I think you need to understand about growth hacking first. I like what you said. It's, it's, it's not just this one thing you do, right? I hear that as well. We're going we're gonna to acquire customers by growth hacking. What, what does it actually mean? It's actual a process, right? It's a lot of dirty work. Should you be doing growth hacking internally? Is it a one-man job? Is it a team job? Or is it, is it, should we hire a digital agency, right? There's a lot of startups say, maybe I'm not the best person to do this. I'm going to outsource my growth hacking. What, how should the startup approach this, uh, this, this concept? Yeah, I would encourage everyone to do it in-house uh, because, as I just mentioned before, it's something that is going to require you to change your product. It's going to require you to change the way that you onboard customers. And if you just try to hire someone else to take care of the problem, you're usually not going to be open when they ask you for changes in anything that is not a simple change. Uh, so it's a lot of really hard work. Uh, it requires you to spend countless hours looking at analytics, uh, writing new advertising, changing your landing page, and getting everyone on board. And one of the main uh, issues that I see when the startups start doing this, uh, this kind of task is that the technical team is going to be like, this is not my job. It's not my job to hear that you want to change the landing page or you want to redesign uh, like this specific feature that we already did, like it's already working, so why are we spending time doing it again? And, and you really need everyone, and I say everyone on board to, to make those changes really quickly. I totally agree with you, and I, I go a little step further because I think, um, in my opinion, it's part of the culture of the company Right, every single person in the company needs to be committed to do this. And uh, recently, this year, in January, we sold one company to Intuit in the United States, and the CEO was the master of that. Was he was in charge of that? So it was his job to dominate every single channel, every single uh, kind of. Uh, he knew everything. That, that's a guy that you ask him. Okay, what is the best campaign that you can? Due to attract the user, he's gonna say, it's rainy or it's sunny today, you know. He, he would know if the weather would impact or not. So it's, it's, and when you talk with a guy like that, you feel really secure that this guy domain the, the, his business. So and then you can do investments kind of thing. Well, I, I little bit lost track what we're exactly talking here because I think you asked about hiring uh, the external guy, which I think is quite impossible for a testing situation when there is uh, two founders uh, making this rapidify, they bring it to the uh, market and trying uh, um, uh, like MVP, and then they sit and say, oh, you know, we should go and hire a growth hacker. We should really hire someone to hire us a growth hacker. This, I, I don't think it's possible, right? Because, uh, first of all, uh, there should be a passion about your product and you cannot uh, just distribute your passion to another person and say, okay, let's you be passionate about what I'm doing and then go out and sell it to all my prospective customers. Well, uh, so, about this, I don't think so. If, if it's possible, uh, I think it's uh, more likely to grow a growth hacker from scratch, from zero inside your team, to become one, if, if you will. Uh, to learn it, a lot of uh, information out there to, to study. Is, is growth hacking the same as marketing? Or is growth hacking changing the way marketing is done within a company? How, how, how do, changing? What, what do you think about that? Uh, I think it's, it's, it's changing the way the market is done. Uh, so, uh, okay, you have the traditional way, right? You can buy uh, uh, AdWords and, but you can also study all the different other channels who can actually bring the better customers to you. So it's all about discovery where is the best channel to attract the best users, the best clients that you need. And I think it's just, I don't know, in my opinion, it's inside the part of the culture of the company. So it's not in the budget of marketing. You understand? It's like everybody's like, Maybe the, the, the CTO is going to discover a new thing. Maybe the, another guy is going to write blog posts and is going to attract best, better users. 
And the salesman, we're going to discover a partnership. We're going to bring a lot of customers too. So it's part of the culture. Yeah, and I think it, it also makes marketing way more accountable because you're not only saying like, oh, let's get everyone to know about my company through traditional channels, but you're saying like, I need to know how much we're paying in each one of the different channels to attract potential customers. And then you have to continue all, all, all the cycle of how you get customers in these different channels to know if it makes sense to continue doing it or not. So once you adopt a lot of these uh, changes, you're going to have to do very clever and accountable marketing. I get Go ahead. Can I compliment with something that I like? It's like, uh, I say when an entrepreneur comes to us and say, I know that if I invest $1 here, I will extract $3 in X number of days. This is the exact point that you should pitch to investors, right? Because now the investors know they're going to put a million dollars, they're going to have $3 million. They're going to put the $3 million, they're going to have $9 million. So it's easy. So I think that's the point you should achieve. Yes, so you like printing money. I love that. <laughs> Do another thing I hear a lot is, you know, I, I'm I'm not a coder. I'm not, I can't become a growth hacker. Do you need to be a technical coder guy to become good at growth hacking? Uh, I I don't think so. Uh, it, it's a, it's a weird situation. You you definitely need to be able to impact your product, not only for marketing or growth hacking, but for anything like. It's going to be like if you learn from your customer that your feature is not working, then you need to change it. So depending on the type of, of uh, value that you're providing to the industry, you're going to require more or less technical people. And that's a decision you have to take depending on your, 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 what you're doing. If you're an e-commerce, traditional e-commerce, you might be able to just have Magento and, and be happy with not having a lot of coders. And in those cases, there's tools that you can use for any part of this. Like if you need more landing pages to make... Uh, different A-B testing, whatever. There's tons of things that you can do without writing a line of code. But of course, if you're doing like a very specific application that no, nothing open source exists, that you need to be able to change it very quickly, then you're, you're going to need, require a lot of coders, right? And, or yourself. So it really depends on your solution. Yeah, but being uh, good with math obviously will help. Okay. If you're good with numbers, if you can crack Excel spreadsheets, pretty good with it, and really dig into your customers, uh, you can make fortune out of it. Right, I think the, the, the number one thing that you're going to need is discipline. Uh, and the second one is just the, the gut of being able to spend marketing dollars. Because if you don't have those two things, you're, you might be spending the, the, the dollars in campaigns and everything, but if you're not having the discipline to go back, learn from them, change them, and constantly try to optimize it, then it's going to be hard. And if you don't dare to spend a little bit of money, then you're never going to see results with, with this. Uh, one thing that is super important for all of you guys is your KPIs, right? Your numbers. You should look to them every single day. If you are in the bootstrapping, maybe every single hour, right? And uh, from that point, you can actually make decisions. And you should pass, right? If, uh, I saw once the guy bought the keyword internet on Google. And I said, why? He said, well, because everybody who is getting for the internet for the first time, they type internet on Google. And nobody was bidding that uh, <laughs> keyword. I said, oh, that's interesting. So, but the guy was testing. And uh, so test and be like crazy about your numbers. Crazy about the numbers. Not only your, as a follower, but the entire team. So Marcelo, you talked about testing and testing often. Marcelo, I remember yesterday when you, when you spoke on metrics, you said, start doing paid traffic now, right? Ah, oh, sorry, Santiago, thank you. Uh, is there a time when it's too early to start growth hacking? I know that these guys come here, they get, man, well, the exchange rate's not that great right now, so let's say, uh, what is it, $31,000 right now with the exchange rate? So, there's not much money. Should they be growth hacking from day one, or should they be trying to do something else first? How, when, when should they begin doing this? I think it's all about the learning process, right? So if you're learning, you're going to learn from day one. Do I have a problem that might, might have customers that would, they, are, they want to pay for this problem? Do I have a solution that actually fix their problem? And so you're, there's different phases of your company. And if you, after when you already have the product market fit, or you already know your solution, you're going to have to validate and test all the channels, all the different uh, type of um, community that you're going to 
communicate to them, the way you're going to communicate to them, uh, the, the, and it just changes through time also. Right? Sometimes uh, your product is uh, connected with something that you can relate with the, what's going on in the news. So it's all about uh, testing from day one to forever and adapt. Well, I think it uh, a bit depends on what financial model you're working with. So if you can look into quick revenues right away with, with your current and with your product, you can start running your bug and it's as early as uh, possible uh, you need to start selling and uh, bringing customers. If it's a more complicated business model when you, are, you need years to get break even, uh, then you anyway you need to think about your burn, if your team already burning 20, 30k a month, then it makes little uh, sense to focus on uh, uh, growth hacking alone when probably all your team will be on the street tomorrow without the funds to, uh, to uh, support the company. Right, for, so you already said that, in my opinion, uh, which I mentioned yesterday, I think that you should start from day zero. And it's not that expensive to start. It's going to require, like if you have just a couple of campaigns, you might be spending $5 a day or something like that. And I know $150 might, might add up to a, a huge burn rate if you add many other tools and things and everything. But you start to learn a lot of things that you're not going to learn other, otherwise, and you're going to, with that, you're going to ensure that you, every day you have a little bit of traffic, and then someone is, is looking at all the changes that you're doing, so you can start learning faster. Uh, of course, if your customer is like one government entity, or like I, I'm sure that anyone can come up with any scenario that it doesn't make sense to have any kind of AdWords or Facebook or what, whatever, but if that's the case, then, then you need to make sure that you're having meetings with those potential customers like every day or every week, uh, so it's not, that you're not going to do it, just, you're just going to do it differently. Um, and, and when I, I say that you should start in day zero, it's not like you're just blindly like turn on like one campaign and have it running all the time. It's like learn from those five dollars every day. See it as an investment. Um, even if you like, if you spent I don't know the first month targeting all that traffic to a landing page that you created in two minutes with uh, unbounce or lead pages or whatever. But every day you change your ads and every day you change the text on that landing page, by the day that you release your product, on the home page you're going to have a message that converts uh, five times better than, than the original message that you had the first day. So by the time that you release your product, now you, you have something that is going to work five times better. It's, it's just, for me, it's a no-brainer. It's going to make your product better. Daniel, this is a question just for you. So, actually, for all of you. <laughs> but beginning with um, Santiago. So 500 is really well known for just pounding metrics, metrics, metrics. Uh, Dave McCurr talks about pirate metrics, right? Can you talk a little about what does it look like to be inside 500 and what do startups take away, right? What skills could these guys learn from, from the 500 style of using metrics? Yeah, so a couple of years ago, our three like, main things was data design and distribution. And we continue to do a lot of that. We, we have a lot of data-related uh, startups in the portfolio, and we have mentors around that. So we try to get metrics very early on to, to understand what's going on. And I, I think there's very clear like design in, in the firm, and I, I, we really like that. But it, w over the last year, I think we've really kind of focused on distribution as one of, of our main things. And the reason is because we're seeing how it works, and we're really happy to double and triple down on it. Uh, we have an internal team of distribution, which is just has like very, very expert, uh, like digital marketing experts who have been dealing with millions of dollars of budget and not just spending that, but really getting a return of investment on that for many, many years. And now they are directly working with companies from the portfolio. And out of those experiences, we like I think all the partners we've been able to really understand some of the best practices and, and see that it's really worth it. So it's like a religion and now we're like going to mass every weekend. Uh, so so we, we definitely have that. Uh, now, on the acceleration, I think that we've been able to get more and more mentors uh, around those topics. And again, we see it working. We see companies growing faster. We see them interacting with customers more often and uh, generally getting to better KPIs that allows them to raise more money, both from us and, and other investors. So it's great. 
Um, not only that, but we are trying to generate a community outside of ourselves uh, with all the, the, the mentors and the founders. Uh, so uh, I think the first weekend of May, we have a, a conference around that in San Francisco called Weapons of Mass Distribution. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so even the name is kind of like getting it out there. Um, so yeah, we're, we're very keen to distribution and we believe it works. Uh, we're, we've seen it working in companies in the portfolio and we're going to be doing more. Can you guys give us some um, success stories or absolute failures regarding growth hacking or distribution? I have both. Um, successful story was, I think, uh, this company who actually, they raised a really small amount of money, $300,000. And they were obsessed about every single cent they invest should generate a return of the investment, right? And it was this obsession, obsession. The guy was not sleeping, and after two years, he was acquired for millions and millions of dollars. Great. The other company, which was insane, was like they raised a million dollars. And the next day, I went to their office, and everybody was with, with a t shirt. And there was a big flat screen, brand new, and they were like, no, we're gonna do, uh, we, we hired an agent to do this marketing for us, and also we sponsored this event. I said, are you crazy? He said, no, no, we're gonna burn this million dollars in three months, and then we're gonna raise another round. You know the end of the story, right? They burned the million dollars, and they didn't raise another round, so. You need to use very well the resource that you have. This is my outcome for these learnings. Yeah, yeah, well, um, well, I don't have any success stories I can share. Uh, I'm a VC, so I, I, I'm not really in a... What have you seen? Sorry, what I have seen? Well, uh, I want to tell other stories. Uh, so from, from VC perspective, uh, uh, I have two cases when uh, a company uh, already secured uh, that two companies already secured Series A and even Series B uh, went uh, to United States to hire a sales team there. It was real sales professionals racing uh, the uh, uh, American market. In the first case, company blew three million dollars and four closed. And in the uh, second case, if you know, enough time to rethink it, stop it, and do rebuild all the sales process again. So, just my five cents into this uh, thing about uh, uh, how to structure your uh, sales, how to think your growth hacking in our particular. Because uh, even with money, you can fail. Yeah, for me, like uh, I'll share one of the portfolio on the success story, and I'll share a, fa a small fail one just uh, for me because I don't want to put on the spotlight any company in the, port in the portfolio on this topic specifically. Because the success would be a company that is doing an application for reminding uh, drivers in Mexico City about um, things that they require to do. Like there's one day, if your car is over 10 years old, you cannot use it one day a week, and then there's a weekend, uh, a month that you cannot use it. So it's just a reminder application. And they, they worked really hard. Uh, they, they tried every channel. They uh, tried every different message and different ways to get like virality. And they went through the whole process of metrics, changes, learning, experimenting, and everything. And they, they, they got to a point where they, they have such an acquisition cost that it's uh, so attractive for them to grow uh, that they went from a couple thousand users to 200,000 users very quickly. So that's like a good chunk of like drivers in Mexico City, which is good. Uh, and now, after doing all of that, they, are, they, are very, they have very attractive business models that they can use because they have the leverage of having real traction. And they continue to grow in really quickly. They, they, so for me, that's a very interesting success story because I see a lot of other startups and applications that might be in the same situation where if they had a, a big portion of the market, they could go and negotiate some of those partnerships. But until you have it, it's really hard to do it. So they were able to hack their way around very, being able to get very cheap installs and then raising a small round with those numbers to grow really, really fast. Uh, so that's one. Uh, the, the, the funny, like, I don't know, fail one for me is that 
uh, I, I released an application on the App Store a couple of years ago and it had like a constant stream of downloads. Um, and I, I didn't implement correctly how to track downloads uh, and I was spending five to ten dollars every day trying different messages. And I spent well, probably like two months uh, experimenting different messages without having the, the correct uh, code to be able to track it. So I was looking at zero installs. But every day that I put a little bit of money, I saw like sometimes there would be more downloads. And I was like, oh, that message worked. So I would change it. And the next day I would get less downloads. And, and I was like freaking out because I, I submit a change to Apple and I got rejected because of a bug. And it took two months to get the right tracking code. And when I got the tracking code, it resulted that all my advertising sucked so much that I was getting like $10 per install. So maybe like one install per day. But I was behaving as if I, I was getting all these changes were because of my different messaging. So uh, I don't know yet how to fix that, but I'm probably going to have to spend more and have better advertising. I want to hear some questions from the audience. What questions do you guys have for this panel on growth hacking? It could be a specific question that you guys are facing right now. Or it could be something general regarding growth hacking. Where? Did I see a hand? No hands. Right here, Pablo. Hey guys, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, so I, I'm really interested in, in the stories. I know you guys kind of mentioned a couple, but I don't know if you have other stories that you'd like to share regarding activities of, on, on growth hacking. So um, you know, because in my company, we're always, obviously, we're spending money on advertising, but we're always trying to think about how, how to grow organically. Uh, and, and, and organically usually means, you know, us participating in events. Like yesterday, I went to an information session for my competitor and try to get some, some information from that, that kind of thing. So, I mean, I'd like to hear some of those stories. If you guys have heard something like that, so we can start thinking creatively about growth hacking as well. Um, I'd like to talk about the topic here a topic that a lot of people doesn't actually do. So we have Facebook, Apple, Google, right? Those are the big main guys that you should talk with. And actually, I see a lot of people working two years in a solution, but they never go to an event of, in Google, and not Google over there, but maybe Google here, or, or maybe Google uh, Hangouts about, uh, they have hundreds of events like this that you can just watch. And I, I don't see people actually trying to communicate with the managers and directors in Facebook and Google and Apple, which is stupid because you can just email that guy and say, hey, I have this product. I would love to see if you can help me to promote it. And guess what? They only receive like a couple of emails like that. So maybe they would like your idea. Maybe they will promote you software or give you or, or guide you to some department over there that can help you. And this is the way actually we put our product in those, uh, you know, editor choice. In, in, it's just having directly communication with those guys. Uh, so do that. That's like, I don't know, hacking, social hacking, right? Yes, it same works for press, I believe. Uh, so don't think that nobody is interested in your startup and your idea. You can pitch the press. I uh, I had one company uh, in our portfolio that actually created a uh, you know trailer like uh, cards for every possible press and blogger in the niche uh, ad tech uh, possible, and then uh, attacked everyone, everyone, everyone until they uh, published the piece. Yeah, one of our mentors uh, co-authored a book called Traction, uh, which has 16 different ways that you can get people to know about what you're doing, one of them being online uh, marketing, but other being press, other being like just hacking uh, different corporate networks and stuff like that. So I would go to that book and, and try to select the top five that you think that could work for your company and then experiment each one of them. Uh, normally, there's going to be one that is going to work 10 times better than the other one. So as you see something work, uh, working, you stop wasting your time with other things and just triple down on what's working. Um, and the other main thing would be finding out what other companies that are similar to you have done successfully in, in other places of the world. Uh, one of the things we do that is always really interesting for us is there's different tools that allow you to see the campaigns that other companies are running in multiple different channels, including Google and Facebook. So just think of your 
either your competitors or people who are doing the same in other geographies and use these tools to find how they are advertising and you can get an idea of it's, if it's working or not. Um, so that's that. This is perfect because I see a lot of guys say, oh, I'm the new version of Airbnb. I'm better than Uber. I'm better. And I say like, so what do you do? No, I don't do exactly what they do. No. So if you are trying to copy someone or, get in, or be better than someone that already exists, don't take this strategy by the picture, by the photograph. Study their history. See how they started. See what was the first channels they used it. And you can, uh, see, in Wikipedia, you can find those, right? And, uh, and I see a lot of people trying, oh, I need a million dollars because I will invest and have in the same channels. This is stupid. Maybe the best way to start is talk with specific bloggers and uh, go to specific events and spread the world or do, I don't know, uh, create a community yourself. So you need to study your, your competitors by the whole film, not only the picture of what they're doing today. This is also important. Hi, um, I have a question about partnerships uh, you mentioned. So, uh, do you have any advice on how to approach those? Because um, you know they might be big and rich, and you're small and poor, and um, <laughs> they they might not want to deal with a startup that might not be around you know, tomorrow. So, how do you kind of get on the same lo same level with them? So, yeah, my you need to be really a pain in the ass. You know, you need to be everywhere. You need to send not a thousand of emails, but I see this. Actually, this happens with with me and some of the other founders. You see a guy, he add you at LinkedIn. He send you a message in Facebook. He send you a message, uh, and even in my phone. I don't know how the guy got my phone number, but he, he got it. And, and I say, like, I end up, okay, what do you want? He said, oh, I want your help. Okay, and it's easily another tip of advice. Never, never ask for a meeting, a business meeting. Ask for a mentorship. You know? So if you ask for a mentorship, the guy feels, oh, I'm a mentor? Okay. And then he gives you a chance. But you need to be, circulate the guy in everything that you can. You know? So I have a question because most most things that you hear about growth hacking have to do with, with the B2C world and has to do with basically going massive and those kind of things. But what about the B2B world? Is there such a thing as growth hacking in B2B? And are there stories that, that you know of and that you can share on that world? It, sure. I mean, there's B2B that you do online, like a SaaS company, and, and most of the B2C things are going to apply very similarly. Uh, if you have another kind of sales process where you're going more of a one-to-one of a -one sale that you're meeting with them, etc., uh, there might be things that you, you can do on the lead generation side, uh, including, of course, doing advertising in LinkedIn, which can automate some of this. Uh, but there's also a lot of people who are automating the way that you prospect uh, people online, including uh, using things like uh, Odesk or uh, there's uh, similar uh, other tools here in Latin America that you can use to pay people to find data, like the way that someone got his phone number, exactly that. There's people that will do that for an hourly rate. One of uh, my ideas of how to growth hack with uh, B2B is basically, say you are in advertising, if you want to sell something to Starbucks or Coca-Cola, you can actually uh, run your product or your service uh, to produce value for them to bring them customers and then send them like the report hey guys see we already brought you customers you probably mentioned this yeah and, and, and you should be using tools and metrics for this too like you should be if you're sending cold emails you should be tracking how many of them get responses and you should be a b testing those messages uh, and you should be very clever about how to uh, either use a crm or like a very good discipline and a spreadsheet to just keep bugging them and have emails every three days saying like, hey, I didn't get an answer. Basically, you can continue until they say no. <laughs> um, I, I, I agree totally with those two guys here, but, and also, I have a, a, a small formula, okay? First thing that I do, I list 100 companies that I would like to talk to. And I try to talk with 
all those 100 companies. I send, I, I add on LinkedIn every single employee on the directors and managers. I send a mail to them. I try to call them. I do cold call and say, hey, I just need to talk with your CEO. And you, I read the name on the LinkedIn. And if, you know, the guy said, oh, and never say, I want, I want to talk with your CEO. I said, hey, I want to talk to Carlos, please. You know, and I schedule a meeting. And if I get one meeting, I say, OK, I present my product. And if the guy say no, I said, could you introduce me to all the two companies, please? So introductions is the best way, right? If you don't have an investor who can do this for you, or a, an accelerator who can do this for you, or a mentor who can do this for you, you at least for 100 meetings, you're going to get one. And that one, you can ask for introductions for other two. And for each one, you ask for introductions for another two. Yeah, introductions are crazy, because once that you get introduced, like. The other person doesn't know if, if it's the first time that you talk with him or you're like the long friend, like you've been, I don't know, you hang out with him, everything. So he is going to give you a lot of attention. That, yeah, a lot of people try to do that with us, I guess. Yeah, and uh, one thing we keep uh, repeating here is the numbers. Like everything goes with the right numbers. So three calls is not growth hacking. 100 calls probably not yet there. 1,000 if you can make it. And that would definitely show some results. And another thing, please, you should do this. Don't hire a trainee or uh, another guy to do it. You should do this because you're going to domain what kind of pitch is going to work or not. And then after that, you can create a script or something, but you should do this. Okay? Guys, thank you. Thank you so much for coming here for today and giving us you know, feedback on growth hacking. So you guys have talked a lot about um, customer acquisition, A-B testing, uh, referrals, partnerships, and things like that, and where you can see this clear distinct uh, line between B2C and a B2B, uh, B2C and a B2B side. And this is a really good question because um, in the B2B side, it's quite difficult to growth hack. And obviously, growth hacking implies hacking a system. So growing at a rate where you normally wouldn't grow in a, linear, in, a, in a linear motion. So, And you also mentioned automization, so making everything automatic. Um, in the B2B side and in the B2B side and B2C side, how would you automate acquisition of customers using your product immediately without literally having a marketing team dedicated to selling or uh, having an SEO team or having, um, I don't know, a good referral program. How would you integrate all of that in an automatic way in your product? Have you ever seen that in the, in, in the portfolio of your companies, for example? You mean like users inviting new users and that kind of thing? How, yeah, for example, in your, in, your, in your product. Or how would you start creating um, leads? So how would you generate leads automatically in your product? Have you seen that in a, in a, uh, in yes, a startup definitely. before? Um, uh, it's a referral, right? Uh, I think like one, one thing that I like to do to say is like the user can pay in cash or he can pay in time. When I say he can pay in time, it's like he will attract new customers, right? Uh, one thing that we did was inside the product of one of our company, we put this, hey, if you know another person who has the same problem that you just solved it using our product, please. Referral, and then there was a, this a box for to put the email of the person and a, a, a box that you can type any kind of message. We did that inside our product because we could read those messages, and we were reading every day. We were like, "Hey, I love this product. You should use it too. I love this product." It was like, "Hey, uh, Dad, you should use this product." So we were actually understanding how those people were referring our product. Uh, but it, there's way more aggressive ways to do it, right? You could do this like, okay, now is a campaign that you can win a lifetime license if you communicate for 100, 100 people right now. Or back on the, the time of social graph in Facebook, we did that a lot. It was like, do you like this product? you want to invite your friends? The, there was a, a problem on Facebook that they, the guy clicked yes, and then we, we would send this message to all his friends. And uh, we could go from zero to four million users in one week. So that was cool times. Doesn't exist anymore, guys, sorry. 
So yeah, for me, I, I think it has to do with the R metrics that we were mentioning before. It's, it doesn't really make sense if you had a recommendation or a Twitter button or whatever. If you're losing 95% of your, of your traffic without interacting in your homepage, like the, most people are getting there and just bouncing because it's not what they wanted. So either uh, you, your product is not really solving a problem that they care or the marketing that, that you're doing is not really useful. It's maybe like very broad and saying like, oh, the free solution and they get there and it's actually very expensive or something like that. So you have to go through the whole activation, like acquisition activation, then making sure that they are coming back uh, and, and you're generating some sort of real relationship. And once you have customers that really solve a problem, then it's a good moment to try to get them to refer people. So I see a lot of people trying to do that before because they want to grow fast and they want to automate this, this part. And it's just never going to happen. Like just throwing buttons or generating these things without having really happy customers is not going to work. So definitely work first on, on having people say like, I love your product. And then you think about how to get them to refer you to other people. So you have to have an awesome product. You have to have a product that people love before you can use your own audience to bring more people. Because even if you tell them, like, I'll give you $50 if you bring me more people, if your product sucks, they are still not going to do it. Or, or they're not going to bring the right people. And one more point. It's not only about acquisition, uh, especially for P2B. It's about churn as well, and it's about collections. And some companies go for acquisitions. They forget about not even to look at over the churn. They forget to collect. And you can, you can do price adjustment. You can uh, subscribe uh, not for a month, but for, for a year, your customer, right? And it will be a significant change for at least your cash flow. Yeah, like we, we have a, a company right now that is doing online guitar classes. And they are recording a, a, a video for each one of their new customers, just so that saying the name and, and asking him different questions and stuff. And they send it, and, and the first reaction of someone who just paid is like, wow, they, they took the time to make a video for me. Uh, so you, you have to do a lot of those whoa moments before this person is going to, to say that, yeah, I'm going to talk to other people who want to learn guitar about this website, right? So uh, I think the, your point was great. Uh, the biggest mistake that an entrepreneur can make is try to scale before have a really good product, right? Because it's just a waste of money. And especially if it's investor's money, this is really a big mistake. And investors are not stupid. We all, of course, we want to see the metrics. Of course, we're going to see the churn. Of course, we're going to see a funnel of acquisition, retention, lifetime value of a client. So um, please, don't even try to raise money before you achieve that. I think it's, um, it's, it's a bad sign. And, and it's better for you to focus to have a really good product who actually solve a real problem. And then you can look for other type of investments is kind of thing. Right. I just remember, you used the word automation, and, and a little bit to that point. You shouldn't automate anything that you haven't done successfully manually. So it, it, a lot of times you're building the product and you say like, oh, I want to send an automated email saying thanks, thanks for registering or like buying something or whatever. And then you, you, you start thinking like, well, maybe there's tools that allow me to do drip email. Like three days later, I'm going to write an email. But you start thinking about these emails, and suddenly you have the task of writing 50 emails that you're going to automatically send to customers without really thinking about someone. So you write these very cold emails that sound super boring and no one is going to read ever. Those are not going to convert. So you have to, to, to do the other way around and say, like, all right, I'm going to email every new user. I'm going to say I'm the founder of this company. And I want to talk to you about like how can we make your solution better. And then the first thing that happens is that everyone thinks like, oh, it's going to be a manual email. So everyone is going to answer to me because every time that I send an email, like people answer to me. And you realize that they don't because it's boring. And, and why would they? So you start to have to be really creative of how to really make emails that convert and get people attention and, and answer to you. And after you do that successfully, you find the pain points that people have, like, oh, you haven't really implemented. Oh, wh like, what's your skill right now? What, what are you trying to accomplish learning to play guitar? And then when you start having those conversations, you, then you can automate. Before that, you're just like doing something because you have a, you, someone assigned you a task of saying, like, let's have drip email, and you're just checking the box. You're not really creating a successful product. 
and that's real work, right? <laughs> so that's one thing that all of you guys is, is, need to understand that you're gonna have to work hard for many days, many hours to have like, uh, you're gonna have to work in a way that nobody wants to work to be able to be successful and live in a way that everybody wishes to live, right? So you need to do it uh, manually, I believe. Even to map the process, right? So if you're only gonna create the process if you do it manually. Well, ne you. Next question. <laughs> well, thank you, uh, very interesting. Um, yeah, I'd like to know if you're uh, in experience, your experience, you already face to a company um, who are like a platform with two entry. Let's say like provider from one side and client from the other side. For example, you have a lot of platforms today with like designer from one side and people who want to buy a logo from these freelancers. And I'd like to know if you already work with this kind of company and what was your priority in terms of investment? Because obviously without a designer at the beginning, you won't have any like offer for the client. And then the end, if you don't have enough clients, your designer... So, so how to grow a marketplace would be the question? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. And a marketplace is easy, right? Priority. Right, priority. Yeah. Oh, this is a standard rule. If you are trying to create a marketplace, you have to have the offer first. So you have to have the community of designers first. This is obvious, right? Uh, we actually, we have a company, we do logos, they have 30,000 designers in Brazil, they are the biggest, uh, who's doing crowd design, and uh, was all, and the, the CEO is not a designer, he never was a designer, so the thing it was, he was posting every single community that he could find Facebook around design, saying, do you guys want to get more money, I can generate leads for you, and after he got like maybe a hundred, Designer, he actually opened his website and tried to receive some clients. Yeah, for us, at least on the on the regional portfolio that I'm, it's the one that I'm more close to. We really haven't had a successful like marketplace, and and what we've had is more like people. Uh, all right, that works. Yeah, so we've had more like pivots towards doing just one side with the idea of then returning to do everything else, like, like doing the marketplace. So it's, it's really, really hard. It's really expensive because you're, you're usually paying for one customer acquisition in, in, a normal cost, in a normal business and here you're doing two. And you really need to have a lot of volume in one side to be able to attract the other side. So my recommendation would be to really like try to do one side first. Uh, it, and usually it's the offer, but uh, the other only thing that could come to mind is just hacking it through partnerships and find a way that you can find someone who already has that audience that you can partner with and then just bring one side. Uh, and that might require doing some lying and saying like, yes, so I have the other side, be it, even before you have it, but... Uh, it, uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm building a, a base of designer, for instance, but is it going to stay with you like if your first client is like one month later? Because in terms yeah. of investment, you can't... Yeah, so, so what he's saying is, is you probably need to have... Uh, provide them value outside of what your marketplace is trying to do on the other side. So it's doing a community, doing something. Uh, because yes, if you just have them like f fill in a form and then you forget about them, uh, for a month or two, you're going to see them uh, leave and forget about you, uh, unless you're paying them money. So if, if they are going to be receiving money from you, they're, I think they're willing to, to wait a little bit. Yeah, uh, one more point, uh, like from obviously Russian, right? Uh, you don't uh, need, uh, so partnership is good, but you can uh, always uh, steal and bribe. Uh, fake it, right? So uh, I, I have a startup of mine that is uh, uh, basically Airbnb for smuggling American products over the border to other countries. Like a traveler coming from New York to Moscow, he's bringing some iPhone and he's getting 30 bucks for this. And obviously it's a platform and we needed travelers first supply to sell their services to people buying uh, American courses. And uh, we just bought it uh, ourselves. 
We ordered many iPhones and uh, put it on eBay. Great. Should we uh, take one last, maybe two more questions and we'll finish. Normally, I have uh, a small problem uh, when I meet like uh, new potential investors. Is they said like I really like your idea, but how much do you think this value in in three years or four years? Normally, I answer because uh, I like to sell, but the problem is when they ask why. So, what are the issues you think I uh, need to present or calculate the formula who give you the value of your company in three or four years? I'm not really sure that I, I got the question, I'm sorry. How do you support evaluation in the future? Evaluation of, of my future. In the future. Like say you have a startup and, and someone asks you like how much is it going to be worth in three years? All right. Uh, so I'm, I'm from a conservative VC. So we look at numbers and uh, on uh, the projection of sales. And then we cut it twice or three times. <laughs> make it smaller. Uh, we look on uh, competition, on uh, example of acquisition deals, so on the example of a series uh, funded by respected firms out there and uh, look at the valuation. And market size, if it's a disruptive model, we go any other possible way to understand how much company will possibly be valid uh, then. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, if you are early stage, well, especially if you are doing something disruptive, it doesn't matter, your relation. If you, you will fail more likely before even reaching one new relation, right? One of the strategies that we use actually is all, all entrepreneurs want to value like a billion dollars, right? So this is irrelevant sometimes so what I, I say is like you know first I will interview you a lot through like six months and I the first interview I'm gonna take notes and I'm gonna ask you so what are you gonna do next month in three months from now in six months from now uh, how much money do you need so I'm gonna ask you a bunch of questions and after six months doing this relationship with you I will know if you are consistent or not to execute Okay, so, okay, this guy is good. He said that six months ago, and now he's delivering everything. And now, what I would like to do is say, okay, you ask asking for a million dollars, but you're not going to spend a million dollars in one month. You're going to spend, what, maybe $100,000 per month? I'll give you $300,000. And I'll wait to see if you can implement on the next three months what you asked, what you told me. If you implement, I'll give you another... $400,000. And if you implement, I'll give another. So I prefer even to renegotiate the valuation later and pay more, but be sure that you know how to deliver the value that you are saying that it, and you control your business. Of course, after doing all the market valuation and uh, market analysis and everything else, competition, of course. But I prefer this way because this way is fair for you and it's fair for me is to we don't have to debate a lot about evaluation. I just have, and the, actually, this is why convertible notes exist also, right? You can uh, do the first investment as a convertible note with a cap, let's say $3 million, $5 million. And then if you really prove that you're good, I have no problem to do a due diligence, a projections, and a thing, and pay whatever you, it values. Uh, and uh, I'm not quite sure why you're asking it. So are you interested in uh, the question of dilution? of control or the possible acquisition in the future. That's why we're talking evaluation. But uh, valuation is not the only instrument, for example, VCs and uh, other institutional investors are using. We have certain provisions that sometimes we are more interested than the value of the company when we are uh, going in. Yeah, it, it, it's a very different topic than the one that we were talking before, and it probably requires really like a whole hour 
of, of, of explaining each one, like what we do, what, what's the, the valuations that we usually invest in and, and how we get there. Uh, but I would say that we are also in that same camp of doing numbers and trying to um, see how you execute. And we, with that, we start to, to see a little bit into the future of what you're trying to execute. And if we don't believe what you're trying to execute, then we're not having a conversation about valuations. Uh, if we really believe in the plan that you're trying to execute and we see the possibility of growth and we see these very clear KPIs that uh, you have a very repeatable way of, of growth, then we can start to predict how investing in that growth you're going to be able to get to certain different milestones. And in those different moments, it's where we can run some numbers and get to evaluation that both entrepreneurs and us, we, we think it's a good business for everyone. Uh, and, and I think it's, it's way more important to really learn everything else that you can negotiate uh, both in terms of controls and how returns work. Uh, because someone might be giving you a very good valuation because, you, because you're optimizing for very small uh, dilution, but you just raise so high. Uh, and if, if he also negotiated some kind of preferred liquidation, then maybe you're not going to see money in, in the exit, right? So you have to be really sophisticated. And there's a couple of books, I can uh, write you a, a couple of them right now, but um, there's a couple of books that, that explain all of these things that you can uh, negotiate and you have to be sophisticated because racing in a big valuation is not equal to win, <laughs> okay? Yeah, also don't forget about convertible notes for early stages, it's very good. And we're always taking it, as a, even as a VC. And there is no talk about relation whatsoever when you are doing convertible notes. So I think uh, hacking growth also means to change your uh, your customers uh, thinking way. So how do you manage to to confront or to engage new customers that are not used to you know to purchase technology or to purchase uh, to a startup and basically are in, in a B two B in a B two B market. And second one is like how do you manage to find the willingness to pay if you have something that is, is new for them and, and, and you think is, is new in the market? That's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> so, so it was how do you get the willingness to pay and how do you get them to pay in markets that are not used to pay through in the internet, I guess? No, to, you know, to new things. To, to new follow. things. Can you bring value to, the, to those restaurant owners? Do you bring more revenue or you reduce the cost of them? If you do one of, if you bring value, like bring more revenue or reducing the cost is easy. If you bring value, but not you know directly way, is hard. So I like the business model. I like products that is easy to pitch in this way. Like, oh, you gonna increase in 15% your revenue if you use my product. And then he's gonna do a math, right, in his, in his mind. And then you can try different price ranges and see what's gonna be better and what's gonna be enough for you to survive. But if you're just like adding value, like that is not directly value, and that is not directly in the margin at the end of the day, uh, that's hard, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think it's it's going going back to the don't automate something you haven't been able to successfully do. So I see a lot of people like in the case of restaurants, they start trying to like buy email list of restaurant owners or something like that. You have to go to the restaurant and talk with the owner and try to sell him uh, and, and just charge him. And after you've done that a couple of times, maybe you're you're able to start hiring more people. But that's a market that it's probably going to continue being an offline sales kind of thing. Uh, I, I think it's also important speaking about, as an example, about the restaurant to, as an entrepreneur, go out of your own way to make uh, possible for the customer to use your service. For example, if you want him to buy iPad and install a, sp install a specific app, charge this iPad and uh, you know, toss it around the, the place to make something, like communicate with you, then it wouldn't go. You should uh, probably understand how 
his uh, IT system works now that he's basically using uh, old-fashioned machines and some uh, software for the uh, cash register, whatever they, they, they are doing there, and uh, make it as simple as uh, pen and paper. Otherwise, uh, you overcomplicate everything and it wouldn't uh, stick. All right, we're going to close the panel right now. So let's give a round of applause for these guys here.